welcome to today's Honors College Lecture Series in the series titled Letters. Today's speaker is Dr. John Vile, Professor of Political Science at MTSU and Dean of the College of, of the University Honors College. Dr. Vile is a graduate of the College of William and Mary and the University of Virginia. He began as Chair of Political Science, the Political Science Department at MTSU in 1989 and has been Dean of the Honors College since 2008. He's a recipient of the MTSU's Career Achievement Award and has written and edited numerous scholarly books on America's founders and the documents they wrote, on the U.S. Constitution and its amendments, and on contemporary political issues. He will be taking a class of 20 honor students to historic sites in Virginia and Washington, D.C. over spring break in two weeks, and I have the privilege to join him on that, as well as several of you. So please welcome Dr. John Vile. Thank you. So I'm going to begin with a little disclaimer, which is that my title might lead you to think it refers to something else. There is a there are numerous articles that talk about a republic of letters, and when they do so, they're usually talking about international correspondence among leading philosophers and philosophers during the 18th century. I am using it more to deal with correspondence of, of people within the United States, and since this is President's Day, uh, we're going to concentrate a little bit more on some of the early presidents than we probably otherwise would. So, I am probably the member of one of the, or the, of the last generation of individuals who courted their wives by writing letters, right? Today, you get on the phone, email, Snapchat, you name it, you do it. But when I was away from my girlfriend, later fiance, now wife, um, Phone calls were considered prohibitively expensive, particularly if it was someone in out of state. Uh, and so I wrote many a letter, sometimes on uh, napkins from Kentucky Fried Chicken at night, uh, all different kinds of ways. And I did, my father did the same thing to my, for my mother, and I'm guessing that his father uh, may have done the same. I'm delighted that we have quicker and cheaper forms of communication but I sometimes think that maybe we've lost something in the process. Uh, maybe I know in my own case, when I write a letter, I usually give it a little bit more thought than if I'm at my computer. Uh, and in fact, one of the primary cautions that I give to students routinely is if you're ready to send an email or a Twitter or a tweet or whatever they're called, think you don't have to send it or at least you don't have to send it immediately. And one of the advantages of letters is that sometimes you think a little bit more uh, before you do it. Now, we're going to talk about American history, but it would be negligence on my part not to say that throughout human history we learn about people through letters. Um, one of the jobs that I have in addition to being an honors dean is preaching on Sunday, and I have preached many a sermon from letters that were written by Paul and John and Peter uh, and others. Many of you know they're a good part of the Christian uh, New Testament. Uh, early American history is replete with people who wrote letters to newspapers, um, often in a series. John Dickinson wrote a very important set of letters prior to the American Revolution called uh, Letters from a Federal Farmer, uh, and there were many others. So I'm going to talk about some of the key people in the United States that I most associate with letter writing. And there's a few better places to start than Benjamin Franklin, uh, the oldest delegate many of you know, both to sign the Declaration of Independence, have a new book out on that, uh, and also the U.S. Constitution. He was 81 at the Constitutional Convention. Many of you probably know that he started as a journalist. And if you want to have some fun sometime, look up a series of letters that he began when he was 16 years old. He was working at the time as an apprentice to his brother, who was a printer, and his brother was not convinced that uh, Franklin, you know, was mature enough or a good enough writer to be able to make contributions of his own. So Franklin would come periodically and slip 
these letters under his brother's door that purported to be by a middle-aged woman by the name of Silent Stugut. And imagine yourself at 16 writing letters good enough that over time men began to write back to the newspaper uh, proposing to this presumed widow that Benjamin Franklin was writing about. Uh, so silence do good. You want to look up that. Uh, Franklin, some of you know, got in a bit of trouble with the British. He was one of the few Americans who was openly castigated before Parliament. And this happened after he apparently released a cache of letters that showed that the Governor, governor Hutchison of Massachusetts really thought very ill of the colonies and really was not presenting their case in a favorable fashion before, uh, before the king or before the parliament. So we go from Benjamin Franklin, oh, we've already gotten it, to George Washington, probably most of you will recognize, father of our country, first president. This is President's Day, so a particularly important time uh, to mention him. There are two letters that he wrote that are favorites of mine. And a couple of these, if you're in my class going to D.C., we have at least one or two of them uh, in the book that I compile for that. Uh, one is a circular that he sent to the states in 1783, just about the time that he was getting ready to resign his military commission, go back to uh, private life. Um, Washington sometimes gets short shrift compared to some of the other founding fathers because he does not have the reputation for quite the intellectual heft of a Thomas Jefferson or uh, John Adams or, or, or James Madison, certainly. Um, and he may have had some help. Hamilton often helped him write some of his letters and other people. But wouldn't it be refreshing if any of the last five presidents could write a letter that said this. He says, the foundation of our empire was not laid in the gloomy age of ignorance and superstition, but in an epoch when the rights of man were better understood and more clearly defined than in any former period. The researchers of the human mind after social happiness have been carried to a great extent. The treasures of knowledge acquired by the labors of philosophers, sages, and legislatures through a long succession of years are open for our use, and their collected wisdom may be happily applied to the establishment of our forms of government. The free cultivation of letters, and letters is a gen more general term. It doesn't just mean personal correspondence. It basically means literature. Uh, the unbounded extension of commerce, the progressive refinement of manners, the growing liberality of sentiment, and above all, the pure and benign light of revelation have it had a ameliorating influence on mankind and increased the blessings of society. Pretty inspiring, yes? Uh, college professors talk like that. You'd raise your hand every other word and say, slow down, tell me what that meant. That's the father of our country. So another letter, uh, this when he was president, is a letter that he wrote to a Jewish congregation in Newport, Rhode Island. And you'll sometimes hear, you know, hear people say, well, all the founders were Christians and this is a Christian nation. Many of them certainly were. Uh, but it was also a nation that, rep that, that felt very strongly about giving religious liberty to all people. And so here's what he wrote to this Jewish congregation. Uh, the date is August the 18th of 1790. The citizens of the United States have a right to applaud themselves for having given to mankind examples of an enlarged and liberal policy, a policy worthy of imitation. All possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. It is now no more than toleration, it is no, now no more than toleration is spoken of as if it was by the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. For happily, the government of the United States, which gives bigotry no sanction, persecution no assistance, requires only that those who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasion their effectual support. And he ended with some analogies 
uh, which again, were I to hear from a modern president, I would probably break into tears. May the children of the stock of Abraham, the Jews, who dwell in this land, continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of other inhabitants, while everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree, biblical analogies if you're familiar with the book of Jonah or some of the other Old Testament books, there shall be none to make him afraid. May the Father of all mercies scatter light and not darkness in our paths, and make us all in our several vocations useful here and in his own due time and way everlastingly happy. That's the Father of our country. By the way, when he was when he was general of the U.S. Armed First Forces during the Revolutionary War, uh, some of his soldiers were celebrating something known as Guy Fawkes Day. Guy Fawkes was a Roman Catholic in Britain a century or two before who had tried to blow up Parliament. Uh, and it was sort of, they would, uh, they would hang Catholics in effigy and have bonfires and whatever. Uh, and Washington had stood out very firmly, you know, if we're going to fight against a common enemy, we can't be divided into Catholic or Protestants or various sects of Protestant. Uh, we all need to work together. So, uh, Mr. Washington, let's go again. It's President's Day, so we'll go to John Adams, and we make sure we get a woman or two in the, in the, in the talk. When I got through, I decided I didn't quite have enough women, and so I probably... Uh, on some other occasion, we're going to have to add a few, uh, but good couple. Uh, pr one of the more literate couples that we have, um, they were very frequently separated, uh, so much so that on one occasion, when Abigail Adams was finally able to go overseas, she actually went to a museum to see a picture of her husband because it had been a couple years since she had been able to see him. Um, the most famous set of letters between the two of them is a set of letters that took place beginning in March of 1776. So it's actually prior to the Declaration of Independence. And here's what she tells John. I long to hear that you have declared an independency. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire that you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power in the hands of their husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. Now, I should tell you that while this letter is widely quoted, uh, justifiably so, it's not altogether clear that John took her completely seriously. Uh, in fact, he sort of treats it as a joke. And so here's what he says. Depend on it. We know better than to repeal our masculine systems. Although they are in full force, you know that they are little more than theory. We dare not exert our power to its full latitude. We are obliged to go fair and softly, and in practice you know we are subjects. We have only the name of masters, and rather give up this which would completely subject us to, wonderful term, the despotism of the petticoat, I hope George Washington and our brave heroes would fight. So it's not altogether clear uh, that he's taking her terribly uh, seriously. Uh, I should mention one other letter of John Adams, and I'm not sure that I think it has been fulfilled, uh, but he writes a letter shortly after entering the White House uh, which is frequently quoted in which he says, Before I end my letter, I pray heaven to bestow the blessed of blessings on this house and all that shall hereafter inhabit it. May none but honest and wise men ever rule under this roof. Significantly, he doesn't say men and women, does he? Uh, he isn't quite to that stage yet. <coughs> Country wasn't to that stage yet. So, some of the most profound correspondence in American history took place between Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But before we do, I want to mention someone else uh, that I've just, I'm working on a book on right now, Benjamin Rush, uh, a medical doctor from Pennsylvania who was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Rush somehow 
even after Jefferson helped found the Democratic Republican Party and John Adams was a member of the Federalist Party, uh, even when they were at loggerheads, were no longer speaking or writing to one another, he was able to correspond with both of them. Uh, and in time was the one, after uh, Adams left the presidency, who got them to renew their correspondence. And as a result, we have about 10 years of letters uh, between Madison, I'm sorry, between Adams and Jefferson that we otherwise would not have. And they are some of the best letters in American history. But I want to mention one of his letters. He, he actually was also a very good letter writer. Um, and he had a dream which is similar to that of every senator who ever has looked in the mirror in the morning. Do we know what they think? If you've just been elected to the U.S. Senator and you look in the mirror, who do you see? Anyone? I'm overgeneralizing, but it's largely, and especially this year, it seems to be largely true. Yes, you look in the mirror and you say, that's a president. That's right. That's me. You know, I could do a better job than the man or woman who's in the White House right now. And apparent, one of the things that's very fascinating about uh, Rush, who, by the way, is sometimes called the, uh, the author of American Psychiatry, is he did a number of letters in which he described dreams that he had. And in one, le in one letter, he dreams, and this is in 1808, so it would be right at the end of the Jeffersonian presidency. He said, I dreamed that I had been elected president of the United States. Now, Rush was a medical doctor. Uh, you probably wouldn't want to go to him. Uh, he had three main remedies, uh, bleeding, uh, blistering and purging, <laughs> and none of them sound particularly good to me. But nonetheless, um, he was one of the early opponents of hard liquor. Um, and so, applying his medical knowledge, he dreamed that he was elected president, and he immediately put into place his program against ardent spirits. Um, and within first month or two, everything went well, people sobered up, uh, and then utter chaos broke out. Uh, you could not find a better prophecy of what happened under the 18th Amendment than what Rush predicted back in 1808. Uh, he found out that his attempt to, uh, to enact what he called an empire of reason didn't work very well, because people were, people were motivated by passions other than reason. And so utter chaos comes out with that, and then he tries something else. Uh, somebody tells him that he needs to establish an empire of habit, uh, and when he tries that, he finds he's even more frustrated. People are so set in their ways uh, that he finds it relatively useless to try to enact uh, his dreams of being president. Uh, that might be... Uh, something for those consider who think they should be president uh, to mull over uh, a little bit. But in any event, Benjamin Rush, um, there was also a very long correspondence between two of our early presidents. Now we've already, oh, okay, there's Mr. Rush, uh, his sort of classic uh, spectacles uh, on top of his head there. Um, these are two of my favorites, partly because they're from Virginia, uh, and partly because, especially Mr. Madison, uh, some of you know I sometimes dress up in costume when I have nothing better to do. Uh, I don't know if it came from a Halloween costume when I was a kid or what, but uh, I always, also, like many senators, when I was a kid, I looked in the mirror and thought that one day I wanted to be president, and it was only about 10 years ago that I realized that the president I wanted to be was James Madison. Uh, but in any event, Jefferson and Madison had a long correspondence, and there are two sets of letters that I find to be particularly helpful. They're too long to read, uh, but let me give you a feel for them. Uh, one occurred after the U.S. Constitutional Convention had proposed and sent to the states a new constitution uh, for ratification. And 
Mr. Je Mr. Madison had been deeply involved in the Constitutional Convention, is sometimes called, not quite correctly, but close enough, as father of the U.S. Constitution. Mr. Jefferson was on a diplomatic mission, as was uh, Adams, and so he had not had a chance to participate. Um, he gets a copy of the Constitution, and he immediately says, you know, well, I like most of what I see in here, but a Bill of Rights is what every people are entitled to against their rulers. He was concerned that we did not have a list of specific protections, let's say, for freedom of speech and religion, protections against unreasonable searches and seizures like you would find in the Fourth Amendment, protections against cruel and unusual punishments like you would find uh, in the Eighth Amendment. And there is a series of five or six letters Madison initially says, well, I don't really think we need one. We didn't give the national government power over speech or religion, so we shouldn't have to worry about it. And Jefferson said, well, you know, even if it doesn't do any harm, if it doesn't do any good, it's not going to do any harm. Uh, if you specify what rights are, then people, if they need to, can go to court to try to protect them. And when we don't know for sure that Mr. Jefferson persuaded, Adam, or, or persuaded Madison on this, but we do know that when Mr. Madison introduced what we today call the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the Constitution, he used some of the arguments that Mr. Jefferson, Mr. Jefferson had written in his letters to him. So chances are it did have at least some effect. Now, one of my key areas of study, and I've done numerous books on this, is I'm very interested in the process of constitutional change, and particularly constitutional amendments. And there's another set of letters between Jefferson and Madison, which I think show their respective strengths and weaknesses. In my judgment, Jefferson was probably the more creative. If you had, you know, if you had to do it on an IQ test, Jefferson would probably win, but I believe that Madison uh, had a little bit more season, you know, Jefferson would introduce something that was very provocative, and Madison would tone it down a little bit. He would realize that perhaps, you know, in theory this works well, but in reality it probably does not. And so there's a, there's a great conversation between them where Mr. Jefferson states as a proposition, and he's a lawyer, that the earth belongs in usufruct to the living, meaning uh, one generation, he says, should not be able to bind another. So he says all debts, and he calculates that every, that every 19 years, and this would reflect an earlier period than ours, but every 19 years a majority of the population is different than it was before, and so he proposes that no debt should be any longer than 19 years, including the national debt. And he also proposes that every 19 years we ought to have a refer or thereabouts, we ought to have a referendum on the U.S. Constitution, or any Constitution. And Mr. Madison compliments, you know, you're a creative guy, interesting thought, but imagine what would happen. Uh, if all debts were canceled every 19 years? What if I had a 30-year uh, house mortgage that was just in its fifth year? Worked out pretty well for me, but would anybody loan, in, loan anything to me in the future? Maybe not. What would happen if every 19 years we voted again on the Constitution? Well, what Madison feared was it would be a little like presidential elections. Every 20 years or so, we go through a major crisis. Everybody would wonder, well, is our fundamental law worth anything or not? And I think Madison had the better of the arguments. But in any event, uh, there's one letter, by the way, that we have most of Dolly Madison's, and I don't have a picture of her up here. That's uh, James's uh, wife, her second marriage, his first. Um, she has a letter in which she refers, she was introduced, by the way, uh, to her husband by Aaron Burr, which is sort of interesting. She has a little letter right before they go off on their honeymoon referring to him as the great little Madison. Uh, he was about five feet six inches tall, generally thought to have weighed about 90 pounds. Uh, but it's sort of an interesting comment from his wife.
Now, one other letter that, or two, three other letters that I want to talk about to Mr. About Mr. Jefferson. One of his most famous is to a group of Baptists, Danbury Baptist, in 1802. Um, and here's what he says. And it's it is now there's a lot of there's a lot of controversy as to whether he completely gets the meaning to the First Amendment or not, but he certainly gets part of it. He says, believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he accounts to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate with sovereign reverence, sort of an interesting term for what he's going to talk about, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should, quote, make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building, and this is one of the most famous analogies in American legal history, thus building a wall of separation between church uh, and state. Pretty dramatic, pretty concise. Uh, if there's any controversy about the Founding Fathers, particularly those from Virginia, and particularly Mr. Jefferson, it has to do with slavery. They were hypocrites. Yes, many of them. They owned slaves. At the same time, they were proclaiming that all men were created equal. Um, and we're still trying to figure out, you know, why did they do that? Uh, some of them, although not Mr. Jefferson so much, some of them would free their slaves uh, when they died. Jefferson appears to have cooperated in the freeing of the slaves that it is believed that he fathered by uh, Sally Hemings, uh, but never had the money, maybe not the inclination, to free his slaves as a whole. But it worried him. So in 1820, when the country was torn asunder over whether to admit Missouri as a slave state and eventually settle on the Missouri Compromise, Jefferson writes the, writes the following. He says, this momentous question, like a fire bell in the night, awakens and fills me with terror. I consider it once to be the knell of the Union. And then he went on to say, as it is, we have the wolf by the ears, meaning we have slavery in our hands, and we can neither hold him nor safely let him go. Justice is on one scale, which would be emancipation, self-preservation is on the other, meaning he fears that if all the slaves were freed, there would be either, well, the economy would collapse, uh, possibly you would have recriminations uh, by one race uh, against uh, the other. Uh, Jefferson's, one of his best known letters, and I always like to have beautiful woman, women on the screen if I can, how is that, huh? Okay. Uh, anybody know who that is? I mean, you know the name because I got it there. Anybody know who, what she was or who she, who she was? Okay, she was a French portrait artist whom Mr. Jefferson met when he was serving as a diplomat in France. Uh, it seems fairly clear that he was infatuated with her. Um, he apparently jumped the fence or did something to impress her and ended up breaking uh, a wrist. Um, she was a married woman, by the way, uh, although, and again, I don't know that anything immoral went on, but they, you know, fairly close attachment for someone who was not his wife. And when he leaves France, he wrote this extended letter, it's about five or six pages, which poses a conversation between his head and his heart. And so his head tells him, you should never establish friendships with anybody, sort of the stoic view, because eventually the friendship is going to end, you're going to be very, very sad. And then his heart says, you know, but uh, wasn't the presence of her company wonderful? Wasn't it great to be around her? Uh, maybe something will still come of this. Maybe, maybe one day she will leave France and come to the mountaintop there at Monticello, uh, Virginia. Uh, alas, she did not. Okay, let's move. Oh, while we're speaking of this, I looked this one up for you just today. 
Oh, I hope I can find it. Uh, sometimes you find personal things. Uh, you know, not all letters are quite this high level. Uh, I'm working on a book right now on George Mason, whose house we're going to visit next week. He is another Virginia planter whose house we're going to see over spring break. Um, he served as a justice of the peace. He was sort of your local squire, and he's writing in February of 1780, and I'm guessing that their February's is a little farther north than this, probably a little colder than ours. And so he writes to a friend and he says the following. He says, this cold weather has set all the young folks to providing bedfellows. I have signed two or three licenses every day since I have been at home. I wish I knew where to get a good one myself, for I find cold sheets extremely disagreeable. Uh, he, by the way, is a widower. A um, little bit later that month, he writes to a cousin uh, and he says, I wish you could recommend some widow or old maid to me. She must be tolerably handsome, though good-natured and sensible. And by April 11th, he was married to a 54-year-old 50 year unmarried, previously unmarried woman, who I guess would have fit the definition of an old maid. Uh, so anyway, not all letters have to be uh, completely serious. So do want to talk, and these are going to be a little bit out of alphabetical order, uh, but this is also Black History Month, so I wanted to make a couple mention of uh, prison letters. Some of you may remember, uh, I think it's been long enough that some of you may have been freshmen, uh, a, couple t a couple semesters back we had a lecture series uh, on prison writings, uh, and there are at least two famous letters that have come out of American history by people in prison. One which I'm not going to spend time on is by Henry David Thoreau. Some of you may remember that he was, uh, he was in prison for failing to pay a sales tax, uh, not sales tax, a poll tax, uh, and he basically wrote a letter saying how he felt, so, felt sorry for his jailers who thought somehow that they would be able to keep his spirit within bounds. He was basically an abolitionist simply by uh, locking him up. But the letter that I wanted to speak about here is Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Some of you know, he wrote a famous letter called The Letter from a Birmingham Jail. Uh, after he was arrested, some of his fellow preachers wrote to him and basically accused him, you know, what are you doing in jail? Uh, you're stirring up trouble here. Uh, we ought to wait. If you wait long enough, justice will occur. Um, and here's what he says. He says, in your statement, it's, it's a fairly long letter, it's fairly philosophical. In your statement, you assert that our actions, even though peaceful, must be condemned because they precipitate violence. But is this logical? Isn't it like condemning a robbed man because his possession of money precipitated the evil act of robbery? Isn't it like condemning Socrates because his unswerving commitment to truth and his philosophical inquiries precipitated the act by the misguided populace which they, when they made him drink hemlock? Isn't it like condemning Jesus because his unique God consciousness uh, and never ceasing devotion to God's will precipitated the evil act of crucifixion? We must come to see that as the federal courts have consistently affirmed, it is wrong to urge an individual to cease his efforts to gain his basic constitutional rights because the quest may precipitate violence. Society must protect the robbed and punish the robber. Uh, and then he also goes on, and I like this a lot. You know, a lot of people said, as people say today, you're going too far. You're going too fast. If you just wait, time will take care of the problem. Um, and here's what he says. He says, such an attitude stems from a tragic misconception of time, from the strangely irrational notion that there is something in the very flow of time that will inevitably cure all ills. Actually, time itself is neutral. It can be used either destructively or constructively. More and more, I feel that the people of ill will have used time much more effectively than have the people of good will. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, 
but for the appalling silence of the good people. So here's, you know, here's someone who writes from prison uh, and is really stirred, I think, to some fairly noble sentiments. So, no discussion on President's Day would be complete without talking a little bit about Abraham Lincoln, particularly when you think that Lincoln never spent a day in college. He spent less time in school than everybody in this audience. And yet, it's one of the most literate, one of the best speakers that we have ever had in our history. I still read his stuff sometimes and weep. Like, you know, what they do with the money I spent on my education. But let's talk about a couple of his letters. One of my favorites, and I've got to give a little context, is from 1855. You know, there's nothing new under the sun. And sometimes we see movements today and we don't know where they came from, and we think they're totally new. But in, in Lincoln's time, there was a movement known as the Know Nothing Movement. And they actually nominated people from pre for president who had a shot at it. They were basically anti-immigrant, anti-black, anti-Jewish, anti-especially Southern Europeans, anti-Roman Catholic. And people inquired of Lincoln, well, are you in a, and they got the name, by the way, when you'd ask them, you know, well, how'd your last meeting go? Uh, sort of like Colonel Schultz, they would say, I know nothing. So they became known as the Know Nothing Party. So, am I a Know Nothing? No, I am not a Know Nothing. I'm quoting now. That is certain. How could I be? How could anyone who abhors the oppression of Negroes be in favor of degrading classes of white people? Our progress in degeneracy appears to me to be pretty rapid. As a nation, we began by declaring, he's referring to the Declaration, by declaring that all men are created equal. We now practically read it as all men are created equal, except Negroes. When the know-nothings get control, it will read all men are created equal except Negroes and foreigners and Catholics. Um, very succinct articulation of, you know, we're founded on the principles of the Declaration of Independence. We need to stay true to them. Uh, some of you know that a letter by an 11-year-old, Grace Bedell, uh, that was written in 1860 is believed to have persuaded uh, Mr. Lincoln to grow his beard. Uh, he actually responded to her and he said, do you not think people will call it a piece of silly affectation if I were to begin it now? In other words, begin growing a beard, but nonetheless that he did. Uh, one of his most compassionate letters is a letter that he wrote to a woman, and I think his information was incorrect, but he believed that she had lost five sons on the Union site. And he said, I feel how weak and fruitless must be any words of mine which should attempt to beguile you from the grief of a loss so overwhelming, but I cannot refrain from tendering to you the consolation that may be found in the thanks of the Republic that they died to save. I pray that our Heavenly Father may assage the anguish of your bereavement and leave you only the cherished memory of the loved and lost and the solemn pride that must be yours to have laid so costly a sacrifice upon the altar of freedom. Again, today is President's Day, this is Black History Month, so I want to go to another famous African American. And this letter is a little tricky. Douglas was in a very difficult position. He had been advocating for, he was a former slave, some of you know, uh, wrote the, the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. He had been advocating for many years abolitionism, and he had also been a strong supporter of women's rights. Uh, particularly the right to vote. And when it came time, when Congress came time to decide whether they were going to introduce an amendment for voting rights, it became clear that if they were to, or clear at least to Douglas, that if the amendment were to give voting rights both to women and African American men, that the people would, that it was not going to be passed. The notion of women's suffrage at that time he thought and others thought was simply, he didn't think was too radical, but he thought it was too, too big a change for the United States to adopt. And so he supported what became the 15th Amendment, which prohibited 
discrimination in the basis of race without, without extending it to, to women. And women rightly called him on the carpet. And here's what he said. The right of women to vote is as sacred in my judgment as that of a man. And I am quite willing at any time to hold up both hands in favor of this right. I am now devoting myself to a cause not more sacred, but certainly more urgent because it is one of life and death to the long enslaved people of the country. And this is Negro suffrage. While the Negro is mobbed, beaten, shot, stabbed, hanged, burnt, and is the target of all that is malignant in the North and all that is murderous in the South, his claims may be preferred by me without exposing in any wise myself to the imputation of narrowness or meanness toward the cause of women. In other words, he believed in both, but if he had to sacrifice one for the other, he thought the plight of African Americans was worse than that of American women, who at least had, in many cases, association with husbands and fathers uh, and the like. Now, I don't want to leave this completely in the last century, so let's look at another letter. This is one that I like a lot. Uh, Dr. Uh, Burns, who is our provost, suggested this. Um, and I like it because I'm the father of daughters, and I suspect that I would have responded the same way. So a guy from the Washington Post named Paul Hume writes a criticism of his daughter singing. And here's how he responds. Mr. Hume, I have just read your lousy review of Margaret's concert. I have come to the conclusion that you are an eight-ulcer man on a four-ulcer pay. It seems to me that you are a frustrated old man who wishes he could have been successful. When you write such poppycock as was in the back section of the paper you work for, it shows conclus conclusively that you're off the beam and that at least four of your ulcers are at work. Someday I hope to meet you. When that happens, you'll need a new nose, a lot of beefsteak for black eyes, and perhaps a supporter below. And then he says, Columnus Westbourne Pigler is a, a gutter snipe, is a gentleman alongside you. I hope you accept that statement as a worse insult than a reflection on your ancestry. Um, I should say that some people think Mr. Hume got the last laugh because he eventually was able to sell, sell that letter for $3,500. Uh, but nonetheless, then I want to give you a very poignant letter uh, by another recent president, Ronald Reagan. Um, after his presidency, 1994, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and he, he wrote a letter to the American people, and it says this. In closing, let me thank you, the American people, for giving me the great honor of allowing me to serve as your president. When the Lord calls me home, whatever that may be, I will leave with the greatest love for this country of ours and eternal optimism for its future. I now begin the journey that will lead me to the sunset of my life. I know that for America there will always be a bright dawn ahead." And then if you want an example of graciousness, uh, George H.W. Bush, um, one that we just laid to rest. Um, imagine leading the American people in one of the most successful wars, a uh, short war, um, and being replaced by someone with no foreign policy experience whose character, I would say, did not come up to his level. But that's, that's a different judgment. I'm not here to make a political speech. But he left this note in the desk for uh, Bill Clinton to read. Dear Bill, when I walked into the office just now, I felt the same sense of wonder and respect that I felt four years ago. I know that you will feel it too. I wish you great happiness here. I never felt the loneliness some presidents have described. There will be tough times made even more difficult by criticism you may not think is fair. I'm not, in a, good, I'm not a good one to give advice, but just don't let the critics discourage you or push you off course. You will be our president when you read this note. I wish you well. I wish your family well. Your success now is our country's success. I'm rooting hard for you. I think I'm going to skip over uh, the letter to James Mattis, so we have just a little bit of time here for questions. Uh, I would commend it to you. Some of you know that he 
uh, recently resigned as Secretary of Defense, uh, and he wrote a letter sort of explaining why he was resigning, saying that he thought the president had the right to someone whose opinions were more closely aligned with his, and in an interesting little twist, says that he's very grateful to have been Secretary of Defense, but does not give any particular praise to our current president. Now, this takes me to our final comments. Um, And it goes back, it's not an attack on Trump, but it takes us back to where we were in the beginning, which is what I like about letters is I think that letters often force people to sit down and be a little bit more thoughtful about what they say. And this is just one, uh, one of many tweets that you have probably seen, uh, which is fairly characteristic uh, of the president. Uh, there's a reference to crooked Hillary. Uh, there's a big dumb mouth. Uh, there are some others. Um, I think people, you know, I, I know people who, obviously people who don't, don't support Trump, don't like this, but I know many of his own supporters who would say, you know, it's a good way to get the headlines and to get people to listen to you, but what do they think of you at the end of it? Uh, And again, uh, and I should add, if you look at some of the newly elected members of the U.S. House of Representatives from the other party, you will see that some of them are sort of getting in the competition here. and I don't, think that, I don't think that's a very good thing either. Uh, you probably detected I sort of favor a kinder, gentler approach uh, to correspondence. Uh, and I think, you know, certainly I would urge you in your personal correspondence, if you have any, uh, think twice. Uh, you know, try to elevate the level of your discourse at least you know, probably none of us will hit the vocabulary of some of these uh, earlier presidents, uh, but certainly uh, I think it's something that we could aspire to. Okay, that's the lecture. We got a few minutes yet, right, that we can take some questions. So go at it. Tell me what I should have added. It, you, you know, I kept thinking this ought to be like a three-hour lecture, that there are so many good letters. and I know I've left a lot out, but any of you have some that you would have chosen? Yes. I just wanted to ask, I know you've talked about how um, you think that we should take more time in our communication in this age, but do you think that the priority in studying these old letters should be learning how to emulate them in today's discourse, or do you think it's more, um, you know, an effort to try and understand the historical figures of the time? I mean, probably the latter is what we usually do, right? We're trying to figure out, you know, I mean, the... The, a letter is sort of an eye into the soul of the person who wrote them, and so we're trying to figure that out. But I think in many cases, you know, particularly these early cases, I think they are worthy of emulation. Uh, again, it's, I find it embarrassing, uh, you know, a college professor with a PhD, I'll read a letter from somebody who doesn't have a college education and their language is much more refined and elevated than my own. I think that's something to aspire to. Someone else, yes. To what degree do you think that we romanticize a lot of the stuff from the past because they are such great figures historically and certainly they do have like beautiful right. letters, but... Well, and again, I mean, I guess the one thing I can tell you is I'm trying to give you a little, a little feel for how some of these were a little hip, you know, you, you see Jefferson, right, you know, you have somebody who can say all men are created equal and he owns 90 to 100 slaves. That, you know, and I, I mean, I can give you some explanations, but they never really prove particularly adequate. So, sure, I mean, they, they had their flaws. I, you know, I sometimes wish that I had, you know, maybe we all do, that, you know, that if we could just look back 200 years from now at how people are judging us and what, what do we say versus what we do. Uh, and often there's a, there's a fair amount of incongruity there. So, you know, I, I, I hope I haven't, I haven't tried to whitewash them, ex- except to the extent to say, you know, we could learn something, to go back to the earlier question, we could learn something about elevation of language when we write. And again, they had, you know, they had less time, to, they weren't watching television and they weren't on their, 
computers all the time. They had a little, you know, uh, when, you, when you took a trip uh, somewhere, it might, might take you a day on a horse. You'd have a little bit more time to think things through. Uh, maybe then we, you know, my typical day, I get 100 or 200 emails. Uh, it's hard to stay focused on something when you have all these interruptions. Okay, anyone else? You've been a very attentive audience. I'm very delighted with that. Okay, I'm going to let you go. Thank you.